Welcome to John Gets Games. Today, I'll be reviewing The Quest for El Dorado. This game was designed by Reiner Knizia, and it is a racing game that uses a streamlined deck building mechanic to get your explorer from the start line all the way to the fabled city of El Dorado. There are no victory points in this game at all, it is strictly about the race, and I'll explain how the game plays first, and then I'll jump into my review. The first thing you have to do every time you sit down to play Quest for El Dorado is to build out this map. You will always start with this rounded edge piece, and you'll always end over here with the city of El Dorado, but there are a bunch of different double-sided pieces that you can work together, as well as a variety of officially sanctioned maps that come with the game. I've just thrown this little one together for demonstration purposes. This is a deck building game, and each player starts with an identical set of cards to start out their deck, and it's worth mentioning that my copy has German words in it, but all of the mechanics are language independent. On a player's turn, they will always start with four cards in their hand, and as you can see at the beginning of the game, all these basic cards just have these symbols on them like a paddle, a machete, and a coin. And on your turn, you can either use a card to move your explorer across the map trying to get to El Dorado first, or you can use a card to get buying power to purchase cards to add into your deck. So let's go ahead and start with movement. When you want to move your explorer, you have to play a card that matches an adjacent uh, tile and then move onto that spot. So for instance, we could play this one card with a machete symbol in order to take our blue explorer and go to that spot. Next, we could play this one with a coin because the coin matches with this village spot here to go into that location. Next, we could play this machete and now we could go over here or we could go over here and let's say we went over here. Scouted throughout the map, there are several of these cave locations. Each one starts the game with four of these randomly shuffled bonus tiles, and as soon as you move an explorer onto a location that is adjacent to a cave, you get to take the top tile, flip it up, and show it to all the players, and then you get to keep this in front of you until you use it. This one, for instance, can be discarded to gain a one-time use machete, and this one will give you a one-time use draw an extra card into your hand. It's worth noting that these cave tiles are designated as an optional advanced variant, but I would recommend playing with them even on your first play. In this turn example, we still have this one sailor left, and we could use this to move onto this body of water if we wanted to. Now, we could do something completely different with our turn if we wanted to instead. When we look at these cards, the ones that have coins on them will actually give us more buying power when we're trying to purchase things from the market. This is what the market is going to look like every time you set up the game to play. Only the cards on this bottom row are actually purchasable at any given time, and you know these are the ones to put down here because they have this little black dot in the bottom right corner. So on your turn, instead of using a card to actually move, you can use them to get buying power. So if we see this one right down here, which would give two machetes in the form of one card, we could use this one card right here with a one and a coin in order to pick up this card. But in this game, you're never allowed to pick up more than one card on a turn. So instead, we might want to buy something else that costs more coins. And in this case, you can use other cards in your hand that do not have coins. Every single non-coin card gives you half of a buying power. So that means this hand right here has one two and a half buying power, but you can never use fractions. So essentially, we could buy something with up to two buying power if we wanted to, and there are quite a few of those things out there. So for instance, we could use these three cards to grab this photographer, which gives two coins in the form of one card. And in the second example, we have this one card left over. It has a single machete, so we could use this to move forward on the map, or if we wanted to, we could save this into our hand and not play it on this turn. Once a player has done everything they want to with the cards they have in their hand, they're going to draw cards from the top of their deck until they have four in their hand. So if we save this, we would only draw three, or if we had played this down to move this character forward, we would then draw four cards at the end of our turn, and it would, the play would then pass over here to the yellow player. As with most deck building games, if you ever go to draw cards into your hand and you don't have enough, you'll take your discard pile, which most likely has newer, better cards, you'll shuffle it up, and then go ahead and draw from your new draw deck and hopefully pull out those shiny new cards. Let's now discuss the map and various things that you'll run into with a little bit more detail. The first thing I'd like to mention is that you're never allowed to move your explorer to any other explorer, including your own, because in a two-player game, each player has two explorers that they're working with. So the yellow player would have to go all the way around if they want to, because they cannot go through blue or red in this instance. The next thing I'd like to point out are these barriers here. Let's say the red player had made it all the way up here, but they're not allowed to move through this piece of cardboard until they have discarded a card that matches the symbol on this barrier. The first person to do this is going to grab the barrier and it's going to go in front of them. This serves to slow down the leader a bit because once this is gone, people behind them can just race right through that corridor and not worry about it. But having more of these is good because they act as a tiebreaker at the end of the game. Farther down the map, we notice some other different types of locations. 
These right here are base camps. You can discard any card from your hand in order to go onto them, but instead of actually just discarding that card, you permanently remove it from your deck by going onto the spot. Next up, we have these grave locations. Uh, in order to go onto these spots, you just have to discard that many cards, but those go into your discard pile. So for instance, this spot right here would cost you three cards from your hand, but it would not matter what those cards are. Next, you may have noticed these locations that have a multiple of a symbol. It's important to note that you are never allowed to combine two cards to have enough symbols to go onto a spot. So for instance, you would need to have a single card with at least two machetes to go onto this spot. But you're always allowed to make change down. So for instance, with this card and three machetes, we could go one and then two, three, because we used two out of these three. But we did not add any cards together. Lastly, we have these mountain zones scattered around, and these caves are also mountains, and there is no way in this game for a player to ever go onto one of these mountain locations. Next, let's move back to the market and discuss it with a little more detail. Every single one of these stacks has three of each of the types of cards, whether it be the starting cards or any of these more advanced ones that are above the market row. Now, whenever a player takes the final card from one of these slots, well, they don't fill it immediately. Instead, it becomes the next player's turn, and if you ever want to buy a card and there is a hole in the market, then instead of just choosing from these six down here, you can now choose from these five or any of these 12 up here. And of course, this will get uh, smaller as the game goes on because we'll pull these down. So for instance, if the uh, new player had two buying power and they really wanted a captain, they would then take the captain stack, move it down into the slot. That player would then purchase this captain from the top, and now on subsequent turns, players have six options to work with, and it's going to stay at six until another one of these stacks gets fully depleted, at which point a new stack is going to get purchased from and then brought down onto the market row. Let's take a look at some of the iconography on the advanced cards with a little more detail. First of all, all of the text down below here just explains what the icons themselves actually do. And the first one I want to point out are these uh, card with the X icons that are on these cards, these cards, and also over here. These are one-time use cards, and you buy them like normal, and they go into your discard pile like normal, but when they come back into your hand, if you choose to use them, you will permanently discard them at the same time, so you only get the use of it once. The, they can be very powerful abilities, for instance, this one down here lets you draw two cards immediately, and then permanently destroy up to two cards from your hand. This one lets you just draw three cards, and this one over here gives you a four power wild. And you'll notice there are non-one-time uh, use wild cards. The way the wild works is you choose one of the three and then you get to evaluate that one. So obviously this airplane over here, being able to have a four machete or a four paddle or a four coin at the right moment is a really good ability, which is why you only get to play with it once. So play will continue around the table going clockwise until at least one person is able to reach one of these spots that is directly in front of El Dorado. You'll notice that this is also double-sided. It could be these machetes or it could be these paddles. Either way, once you finish your turn on one of these spots, you will get moved onto El Dorado, and at this point, players will continue to take turns until everybody has taken the same number of turns. And you'll know this because the start player should have had this explorer's hat here, so you'll keep going until the person to the right of the start player has taken their turn. If at this point only one person reached El Dorado, then they are the winner. But if multiple players were able to reach El Dorado within that same round, then it comes down to the barriers that the players were able to grab as they ran through the forest. You'll notice that they have little numbers on them. In this case, the three would beat the two. But if a player has more barriers than the other, then that majority is going to win it for them. So in this case, if blue had two and yellow had one, then blue would be the winner of this game of El Dorado. Let's now begin the review for Quest for El Dorado by starting with a few positive points. The first of these has to do with the race-oriented deck building that you're doing in this game and how it feels pretty fresh to me when I'm actually playing it. And I really enjoy the decisions that it's giving me because there are no victory points to be had in this game. Unlike most deck building games, there is only one goal and that is to get from the beginning to the end as fast as possible. So that means that with differing maps, you are going to be building different styles of decks. If you have one map that has quite a bit of water, especially like a big roadblock of water, or for instance, if a little shortcut that you can skirt around needs like a three paddle type situation, then maybe you're going to be much more likely to draft those captains and get those wild cards into your deck versus another map where the water's kind of scattered around, but you can easily dodge it. You want to do other things, like maybe there's a massive village, now you need to worry about having the right amount of coins to actually get through that in the most efficient manner possible. 
The other thing I like to uh, compute in while I'm figuring out what I'm doing and I'm playing the game is look to the very end of the map because that is where the game gets really explosive, where turns can zip you across entire tiles within a given turn, depending on how good your deck is. You want to look to those later tiles and be like, whoa, that last tile has tons of machetes. So I need to prepare for that and maybe even early in the game, start grabbing decent machete cards to put them into your deck so that you have them at the ready when you actually get over there to the end of the game and you can just blast through that tile versus maybe a different ending tile that just has big cities or has water. You get the idea. So I just really enjoy the process of building a deck that is just trying to match the efficient route uh, that you like on the map as closely as possible, as opposed to hunting down victory points, that kind of thing that you oftentimes are doing in deck building style games. Positive point number two has to do with the market filling mechanic. I just really like the way that the card options flow through the market as the game goes on. And I think it's a really great idea to have the uh, holes in the market get filled by your opponents. It gives you extra decisions that you're thinking about, especially when you're trying to dra draft that last card from the stack. If you take it, that will leave that hole open. And then one of your opponents has first dibs on grabbing up to uh, 12 other different types of cards, depending on how early and on it is in the game, to actually pull into that spot. And it means they'll probably be able to target the one that they really want. But maybe they won't get that many coins in their hand or they find something else that they really want to do or maybe they just buy one of the other uh, five cards because that card just really works for where they're at and it might come back around to you and then you can actually fill in that hole. And I just I think it's such a neat idea that as you're playing the game, the majority of the time you have six or so options that you can choose from to buy uh, cards from the market. But then every now and then you have this wonderful moment where every single card is available to you as long as you have the right amount of coins in your hand, of course, to be able to pay for the ones that you want. Uh, more often than not, the one you really want is still going to be out of your reach even when there is that gap in the marketplace. But either way, I just think this is a really great way to flow the cards through and also to have one game play slightly differently than the next. Even though all the cards are in every single game, they are not going to come out in the same ordering especially when you consider the positive point number one, uh, from one map to the other, the uh, order in which those cards are going to get pulled down onto the market is definitely going to differ. And I just, I like seeing that. For positive number three, I want to discuss the interesting dilemma that the game oftentimes gives you on each of your turns. And that realistically is how fast should you go right now? Now, a large part of this has to do with the cards that you have in your hand, of course. If you just drew a perfect hand for moving across the map, then that's probably what you're going to do on that turn. And if you just pull a bunch of coins, then maybe this is the turn where you just go to the market and you buy cards. Or if you're next to a bunch of villages, you'll use those coins to then move across the map. But more often than not, you're going to have a bit of a gray area between these. And you're going to have thoughts like, do I move three or four spaces? If I move three spaces, then I'll have enough buying power to go over here and buy this card that I think is better. But if I move four spaces, then next turn I'll be adjacent to this one spot and I can get a little bit farther ahead. Um, and it's not always just three to four. Sometimes it's do I move one or four. Sometimes you also want to think about not necessarily taking the most streamlined path. The game seems to be constantly trying to tantalize you with things off of that beaten path. For instance, you have the cave tiles. They're big stacks of shuffled up, shuffled up actions that for the most part are really good for you. But you might have to cross a little bit of water to get to it or go a little bit out of your way. Uh, another type are those base camps that let you walk into them and permanently destroy a card that's in your deck. Uh, you might be wanting to kind of curve around like this, but with that base camp over there, you really also want to just go over there and then jump in and out a few times. It might even eat up a couple turns to just thin down your deck so that you are going to be able to get to those really great cards that you purchased much faster. But as you are jumping in and out, everybody else is likely getting farther and farther away. And the dilemma is, well, when do I stop? When do I decide, okay, that's a little bit too much. I have to start catching back in. And lastly, it's great thinking about when do you think your deck is done? You are, as I mentioned before, trying to build a deck that matches the map that is in front of you. And it's likely that at some point in the game, probably in the two thirds to three quarters of the way through a section, you'll realize that you don't need to deck build anymore. And in fact, you're just going to go pedal to the metal, probably ignore deck building as much as you can and just try to get as far as and far and as fast as you can because your deck is just done. You're like, I have confidence in it. Let's see if it's actually going to pan out for me. And I just really like all of these different decisions that come together in this great uh, dilemma. It's just very satisfying and a big part of the reason why I've enjoyed playing this game.
For my fourth and final positive point, I'd like to discuss the great player interactions that happen in this game. Realistically, there are two main ways that you're going to be interacting. One is blocking out on the board, and the other is uh, grabbing cards from the market that your opponents might want. Let's talk about the board first, because I think this is the one that I enjoy the most. And in general, I don't really like direct interaction in games, where I reach out and slap my friend across the table, metaphorically speaking, with a card or a take that type thing. But in El Dorado, I have no problem cutting a friend off and then forcing them to take a really slow route to get around me and just staying in that spot. In fact, there are some places on some of these map tiles that literally come down to a choke point of just a single spot. And I've seen situations where a player is able to get ahead, they get into that spot right ahead of everybody else who might be trying to take that shortcut as well, and then that player just stops for several turns and they do some deck building. And that means that everybody else is choked up behind them. There's no way to get through. And so eventually they might do some deck building or maybe they decide, you know what? I'm just going to go around the slow way. They'll backtrack. And of course, the moment people start doing this, the person in the choke point starts moving forward because they don't need to choke it up anymore. And now they have an even better deck. And I just, I really like the uh, kind of interaction in this game. And I know that to certain people that might actually be frustrating, but you can always go a different way. And it gives you a bit of incentive incentive, uh, talking about the dilemmas uh, in the last um, point I just mentioned, it gives you an incentive to get a little bit farther ahead. Maybe you don't buy that awesome card because it gets you into that really great blocking position to then actually sit around and try to do a little bit of deck building while everybody else laments your position. Um, uh, the other type of uh, player interaction has to do with just drafting cards from the, uh, the open market, I guess buying these cards. The fact that there are only three cards makes it very, I think, uh, intentional of a design decision that you are going to be denying good cards from your opponents. I mean, in a four-player game, that means, by definition, everybody cannot have one of every single card. There's only three of each. And even with lower player counts, I've seen situations where really good cards get sucked up by uh, even one or two players so that the other player doesn't act, have a chance to grab it. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it came out and they were all gone by the time that person had their first turn to see it. But it depends on the cards you have that come out in your hand. If you don't have enough coins to actually buy that card you want, or going back to the dilemma, if you decide that it's more important to get into a better position and you're sure you'll have enough coins to grab it next turn, but by the time the next turn comes around, it's actually gone, well, that's a really good amount of indirect interaction that comes into play with just trying to grab the really good cards before your opponents do. It's now time for us to shift over into a couple neutral points, and the first of these should seem pretty obvious, and that is just that there are only 18 types of cards in this game, and that is a very low number of cards for a deck builder. I can't think of any that has less than that that doesn't consider itself a micro game, if that gives you some context. And it, sure, in one game you will have certain cards come out in one order, and the next game they'll come out in a different order, but at the end of the day, it's just that same set, and it's very likely that for some people, the uh, variable order in which they come out is not necessarily going to be enough to keep them feeling spiced up about the various options that can come out. It's definitely a perk for many deck builders to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of different combinations of cards that might show up in the game, or even just have a big deck of cards that has like 30 or 40 different types. But in this one, it almost feels like a design challenge to streamline down to just these 18 cards and then go one step further and say that every time you play the game, you're always going to start with the same six. And I just know that's going to bug some people. No matter how much I say, well, it'll be different from one game to the next based on the map, at the end of the day, there are going to be people who want a wider variety of cards. And honestly, I would not mind a wider variety of cards. I would definitely look forward to uh, an influx of uh, different card types from an expansion or something like that. But... At the same time, that market uh, flowing mechanic works so well that uh, it makes this a neutral point. I don't think it's actually a uh, something that brings the game down. I just think that it kind of leaves it right in the middle, and it's definitely enough variety to play the game many times, and I'll talk about variability in a little bit, but at the end of the day, it might not be enough for everyone. For neutral number two, I'd like to discuss the aesthetic appeal of this game when it's sitting out on the table, and I think that it has some things going for it and some things going against it. When you walk by a table that has this game down on it, your first reaction is likely going to be, whoa, that's a cool map. And your second reaction is going to be, whoa, those are really ugly icons that I could see everywhere. And when it comes to form over function, I do think that function is important. And the fact that the game, that every single one of the hexes in the game has a large icon that tells you what you need to actually enter it is probably a good thing. But it also means that when you're looking out um, at the map in front of you on the table, you see a sea of machetes as opposed to a forest of trees. So from an artistic perspective, 
It does not look amazing when you really get down there looking up close. But on the other side, I love the variety of different maps that you can build. You can have something snake across the table. You could have a big line. You can make something almost a circle. You could throw all of the tiles together into just making a mega map if you want to, or even uh, use less tiles if you want to play a quicker game. I really enjoy the map building style, and I enjoy looking at the map on the table. I just think the actual art on the specific tiles, while highly functional, is not the most pleasing thing to look at. We've now reached the point where I would normally discuss various negative points to the game. These would be aspects about the design that I felt should have been reworked in some way or another because it caused issues with the overall gameplay, but I honestly can't come up with any. So let's go ahead and move on. Let's now go into the variability for Quest for El Dorado, and I think that it comes out about average, but this is a tug-of-war average as opposed to every single aspect of the game having a decent amount of variability. Uh, so what I mean by this is, on the one hand, you have a ton of variability with all the various maps that you can build out on the table, and on the other hand, you only have 18 different action cards that you can build into your deck. So while you there are a variety of different types of decks you can build, it's nowhere near as much as you would normally expect for a deck builder. And what that means is both of these things are kind of doing a tug of war, and I think at the end it comes out to be about average. I do think that if this game got an expansion that um, added even you know six or eight new cards that could be shuffled, uh, not shuffled, but cycled in to the uh, market from one game to the next, it would easily tip the scales way over to a highly variable game. But that being said, I've played the game many times already, and I've never felt like, oh man, this is it, I've played everything already. So the variability, I think, it's average, and it's good. Quest for El Dorado plays two to four players, and I've played all of those different player counts, and I think that while it's actually really good at all of them, it is best at two. And the reason for that is because, well, the two-player game is actually somewhat different than the three- and four-player experience, because at two, each player has two different explorer pawns that they are trying to work throughout the forest, which means you are actually going to be doing essentially two races instead of one, because you have to get both of them all the way through the map, all the way to the end, and that means you're going to have to do twice as many actions to do that. But that also unlocks some other interesting things that could go on, uh, especially when it comes to blocking, which I really enjoyed when playing this game. Because it, uh, you can have situations where you have one explorer get into a logjam spot and block your opponent while the other one does something productive. Uh, that did happen to me in one of my games where I, I literally it went like three turns and I looked across to my opponent and I said, you're not going to move that one until... I go the long way, right? And he just smiled and nodded because it's not like he even had to sit there building his deck while he was jamming up that spot. His other one was racing all the way over to El Dorado. And while I could try to do that with my other ones, it was just a neat extra thing that you have in the game with the two-player experience. I liked having those two pawns. And because of that, I think that the four-player experience is also great. And it's the second best way to play it because once again, you have four pawns out on the map. That means there are four pawns that are gonna be blocking each other and jostling around. And at the three-player count, there was less of that going on, but the game was still really solid. In conclusion, I played Quest for El Dorado four times at this point, and I've really enjoyed every one of those plays. My expectations were reasonably high going into it because I've enjoyed many Ryan or Knizia games, I've enjoyed many racing games, and many deck building games, so I figured when I combined all these things together, I would probably like this game. But I was not expecting to really, really like this game. The amount of fun I've had every time i played this it definitely exceeds what I was expecting going in, and I think it has to do with, well, everything I've talked about in this review already. Like, uh, you have the streamlined deck building where you are just focused on trying to get from the start to the finish. You're not worrying about clogging your deck up with victory point cards or anything like that. You also have great play player interaction where you are taking cards away from them out in the market and more importantly, trying to get in front of them uh, on out on the map and try to make their turns less efficient. And then of course, the fr mild frustrations of uh, your opponents getting in your way, which I still really enjoy. And then also just the variability of having all of these different maps. I really enjoy building different um, decks from one game to the next um, to try and match not only the map situation, but also to maybe try slightly different strategies. Like in one game, really get that deck incredibly thin. I've had, I played one game where I think I had seven or eight cards, maybe even less than that in my deck at the end of the game. So it's pretty much just flip-flopping one turn to the next. And I think I played a game where somebody had like five cards. So they're pretty much just playing through their entire deck every single turn. But I'm not sure if they necessarily won because you need to make sure that those cards work out well for the map in front of you. So when you combine that player interaction, the market, as well as the uh, deck building, the streamlined deck building um, decisions that you're making, it's just a really great game. And I do feel like having only 18 types of cards in the game is not necessarily a big bonus for the game. I feel like that was almost a design challenge to try and slim down to just that and see if the game still works, and it certainly does. But 
I would be lying if I said I wasn't looking forward to maybe an expansion coming out for this game to increase the amount of uh, variability from uh, cards that you can uh, flop into the market from one game to the next. So yeah, in conclusion, I really uh, recommend this game. I've uh, had a ton of fun playing it, and I think that odds are good if you like racing and or deck building and or Ryan Arcanesia, especially all three of these, that this one is probably going to be one you really like too. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel through Patreon, including all of these producer-level pledges. If you too would like to directly support the channel, you could do so at patreon.com slash Games, and I'd really appreciate it. Also, if you'd like to see more in-depth board game reviews like this one, as well as full game playthroughs and vlogs, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.